I feel nice and relaxed now. <laughs> a few years ago, I went through a painful relationship breakup. I was dumped and replaced by someone she described as younger but more mature. <laughs> called Dougal, the name which did partially soften the blow. She said I was too self-centered, too selfish, too much of a northern tight ass, and too wrapped up in my own stupid projects. To heal the wounds, I took a year off and set myself a project. <laughs> Part of the inspiration for the project was this, Christmas wrapping paper designed by Victoria Beckham in our esteemed lifestyle magazine known as the Guardian newspaper. I'd um, become saturated with the media and I'd had it up to here. I decided to throw out the television and I decided to stop buying newspapers. I stopped um, engaging with the news in terms of the way that it was presented to me by the media and stopped listening to the Today programme in the morning. And uh, the experiment continues and it's been a great success. Um, but that's not what this talk is about today. It was part of the inspiration for me to go and seek a different reality. And the, reality, the different reality that I wanted to go uh, and experience was uh, a big one. I thought I'd go in search of utopia. And I'd always had a fascination with alternative communities and, uh, and alternative cultures and a growing suspicion there was more to life than my own hollow, self-centered city boy existence. But I knew it was a foolish venture. But I was partly uh, inspired by uh, Mr. Oscar Wilde, who said, Utopia is a country in which humanity is always landing. And when humanity lands there, it looks out and seeing a better country set sail. Progress is the realization of utopias. So I did my research. I found about seven or eight places that sounded extraordinary and challenging to me, and, uh, and I set off. Now, this was for 12 months, so I'm going to try and pack this into about seven minutes. So um, it is going to be rather condensed. So I'm going to choose five of, the, of my favorite places that I visited. First stop was Christiania in uh, Denmark, a self-styled loser's paradise, an anarchist community. From the moment I walked in, my heart sank. It was full of uh, dope-smoking jugglers sporting way too much tie-dye. It wasn't the kind of place that I'd been looking for. But the wonderful thing about Christiania was uh, partly the housing, the fact that all the residents there have, have built these houses um, themselves, and uh, they're all quite extraordinary. Munchkin Tudor, my uh, friend Mark, calls it. Uh, one guy even chose to live in a 1970s uh, Doctor Who style UFO. And for the first few days there, I was pretty much a tourist, a spectator. And uh, I, I learned that the whole place uh, was set up and continues to, to survive on just three rules. It's an anarchist community. After all, the rules are no hard drugs, no violence. And the third one, which is a bit vague, is if you do stuff that pisses people off, there'll have to be a meeting about it. <laughs> After a few days of, of, you know, feeling a bit of a loose end, I was introduced to this guy, Emmerich, and Emmerich was building a new kitchen in his house. But he wasn't going to bring in the professionals. He didn't need to. He lived in a community. He would ask his neighbors, and he would ask his friends. And I volunteered to help as well. I was keen to have something to do, get my hands dirty there. And so for a week, we did. We did some pretty hard labor. And that was my favorite time in Christiania. Well, not so much the hard work, but it was afterwards when we go down to the hot tubs. And it was in the hot tubs there that I realized this was where the real decisions in an anarchist community took place, not the Friday night meeting where 400 anarchists sat in a circle and tried to come to an agreement about anything. And it was also down there that I met the old timers. And they told lovely stories that, you know, they were reminiscing about the, uh, the glory days of, of Christiania. And the fa my favorite story that I was told was the, the Father Christmas Wars of 1973 when they mobilized an army of over 200 Father Christmases and sent them into uh, Copenhagen to liberate goods from the uh, department stores. <laughs> and um, they'd half emptied the places by the time the, uh, the police arrived, and they'd given them all out to the poor and the needy in the street, and uh, <laughs> ended up a running battle with the police. Uh, and Christiani was heavily fined for this prank, but they had the last laugh. In 2004, the film of this was voted to be in the top 10 most important works of art in Danish history. My next place uh, of interest was Findhorn in Scotland. Some of you may have heard about this. It was set up by uh, these three people in 1962. And it was originally just a caravan park. They were down on their look living in a caravan. They weren't intending on staying very long. But Eileen on the top right was getting the voice of God. 
She couldn't tune in very clearly to the voice of God, six of them in one caravan, all very noisy, next to an RAF base up there. And so she asked God if he can suggest anywhere quieter for her to go and tune into his words. God being God said yes he could and suggested the caravan site toilets between the hours of four and six. <laughs> And it was here that she learned uh, that God's instruction was to stay put and build a magic garden and they will come. And that's exactly what happened. And then for the next few decades, the place uh, flourished. It became part of the hippie trail. And now there's 600 people living there. And the, uh, the caravans are being phased out in favor of much lovelier um, structures, uh, big wooden Scandinavian style houses. But you can go and visit the original caravan that they lived in, which has been lovingly preserved, along with the sign, Original Caravan. <laughs> now, the horrors of Findhorn for me were stuff like this. Spiritual healing for your pets. Forlorn-looking dogs sitting on a bed surrounded by soft toys. And, and people driving around with, uh, with these angel stickers in their cars. Angels at work, never drive faster than your angels can fly. And I remember saying to one of the residents, I've got to admit, the whole angel thing, because they, they draw little angels on all of their paperwork and everything. The whole angel thing here at Findhorn just, it turns my stomach. I can't get on with this kind of stuff. And she said to me, it's just a f***ing metaphor, get over it. <laughs> And I realized I probably could. <laughs> the highlight finned on for me was these people. I'd signed up to a thing called Experience Week. And at the beginning of the week, all of these people were complete strangers. I thought I had nothing in common with them. It was going to be a long time. Uh, the, the, week, the week was going to drag. But uh, in fact, the opposite. By the end of the week, my relationship with these people was extraordinary. Just through the, the activities that we did together, the times we shared, the stories that we shared. and particularly communal meals. I rekindled a love of communal meals. I don't think I'd experienced it since uh, school time or college time. And sitting there with people from all over the world having uh, inspiring conversations. And also the washing up as well. I discovered that washing up can be fun if done with six people in a kitchen and you're all sharing jokes and stories. And I wish I'd known that before my uh, relationship break. It might have saved it. <laughs> and it was in Findhorn behind the Universal Hall that I discovered some hot tubs. And it was down there that I, I encouraged my Experience Week group to come and join me. And it was there that not just the stories and the jokes, but also the harrowing life experiences came out as well. And so a lot of very deep and compassionate sharing took place as we wallowed in the healing waters, talking to each other. And at the end of the week, the hugs and the compassion um, that, that took place between all of these people um, in the Experience Week group was really heartfelt. And I had a profound change as a consequence of this. And the third place that I wanted to tell you about, which was by far the most extraordinary, is Damanhur in Italy. And uh, I had a, a, similar, um, a similar setup there. I was in a place called a Nucleo, which is their communal houses. I spent a month there with these people. And all I can say is a very similar experience to Fintorn. They now feel like an extended family. As for Damanhur's people themselves, this is Salamander Olive on the left, and this is Hobbit Watercress on the right. <laughs> Everyone in Damanhur is named after a plant and an animal. The favorite people that I met were swordfish banana <laughs> and sponge strawberry. They all sound like Delia Smith recipes. They also claim to talk plants to, uh, to, to play music. And this was a seven-inch single released by Heli, a rubber plant, uh, on Horus Records. It didn't do very well in the charts in Italy, but uh, Heli did do a tour of the pubs and clubs of Europe uh, a few years ago. And, uh, and I did get a chance to jam with Heli. Here she is. She's wired up to, you can't see, she's wired up to a keyboard. I jammed along on keyboard as well. For those who are interested in such things, she seemed to favor A minus sevenths. <laughs> the most extraordinary claim of Dam and Her is the temples of mankind. It's the world's largest underground temple. I don't know what the competition is like. And it was built in secret over 30 years at night. And down there, the, uh, the various uh, temple rooms are extraordinary. And some of them also have secret stairways. So you need to know where the button is on the wall, the secret button to press, so that the stairs take you into the next secret chamber. And in that secret chamber, you need to know which stone slab on the wall to press. And when you press the stone slab, the whole wall gives way, and you're into the next chamber. Real Indiana Jones uh, setup down there. And their technology is out, is out of Star Trek or uh, um, uh, Star Wars. Everything fizzes and glows and lights up in a satisfying way, and this stuff is used for, for healing. And also, I forgot to mention, they've built a fully functioning time machine uh, inside 
there is a secret underground temple. Here it is. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it's a strange, uh, it's an unusual photograph. It's looking from down below, but it's essentially a lot of tubes full of, of bubbling alchemical liquid and, and, a, and a great big uh, throbbing magnet which, uh, which surrounds it. And the instructions for use for the time machine are written in hieroglyphics on the side in, in the walls in this, in this room. But if you can't read that, get hold of a copy of the Kindred Spirit magazine's uh, time travel special where you can uh, discover how, how time travel works. Uh, and also in there is an interview with Gorilla Eucalyptus, who was their um, main time traveler. And uh, there's a, a, you can read an interview with Gorilla where he traveled back to the year 4719, met some local people and ate some blueberries. It's riveting stuff. Now, uh, it may sound like I'm being a little bit flippant about uh, Damonhurst claims to have built a fully functioning time machine. They also claim that the guy who set the place up is, is an alien from the future who came back to Earth to save us from imminent destruction. The Earth has already been destroyed. We are now, now on a new timeline. And to power a timeline, you need to, uh, to build a community on a synchronic knot, which is where the temple is. And if the, if the synchronic knot provides the energy for us to create a new timeline, but every now and again a timeline can, can uh, need a bit of repair, like a rail track. And the only place that sells the spare parts is a little shop in Atlantis. And to get to Atlantis, you need to build a time machine. That's why they built the time machine. Um, <laughs> but they don't present this as their truth. They present this as their myth. They say, this is our myth. And I think the Damonhurians are very smart people. They've created a living myth. They're inhabiting this myth. And every day, it gets richer and deeper. And it's a story that we can connect to. It's the story of the Earth being destroyed. And it's like a film like The Matrix or Star Wars. If that, with some people, those, those stories, those ideas resonate with them. And they say, if our myth resonates with you, then this could be your utopia. And I believe that. And the other thing that they've done is they've taken on board Oscar Wilde's idea that progress is synonymous with utopian thinking. And so they've set a challenge. Anyone who becomes a little too set in their ways in Damanhur is set a challenge by the game of life. As you could get a knock on your door, you've got to be out of your house for the next six months, and you have to do something like building a village of tree houses, which they have there as well, which are, are extraordinary. They also claim to be uh, communicating with the trees on an intelligent level. And I did ask uh, if the trees had any if they had any information for us uh, that needed passing on from the trees, and they do, so I'm going to present it here, and that is the trees have kindly asked if humans would stop hugging them. They don't like it. <laughs> Esalan Hot Springs in California. I headed over to America, and I found my paradise. They've got hot tubs there that are perched on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean. You can sit in those hot tubs morning, noon, and night, and watch dolphins and otters. There are giant redwoods, butterflies, hummingbirds there. And in those hot tubs, I had inspiring conversations with heads of state. I met brain surgeons. And on one occasion, I met half the cast of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, <laughs> and apparently, Sarah Michelle Gellar is quite hard to work with, but I don't know if that's libelous to say that. In um, and I loved Esalen. I, I, had, I had no desire to leave this place. I really felt like I had found my utopia. And I also became very friendly with uh, this guy called Hekes, who had lived there since the 1950s, remembers playing table tennis with, with Henry Miller. And he took us for walks in the redwoods and told stories about pretty much every tree and every plant, all the animals there he had, he had stories for. And uh, he, uh, he recognized my reluctance to go. And one evening, we're sitting in the hot tubs, and, uh, and, and Hekes says, this, this is my paradise, David. This is where I was born. This is utopia for me, but your utopia is at home. He said, go home and make utopia there. I'll tell you my gum wrapper theory. You're walking in the woods, you see a gum wrapper on the floor, you pick it up. You don't have to be holy, you just become an example. And he said, anyway, don't stay here too long, or you'll end up like half the old bastards who built the place and used to teach here. And I said, why? What happened? And he said, well, look around you. All of this beauty, can't you guess? They drank themselves to death. My final place was Arcasanti, which is in the Arizona desert. And um, Arcasanti was set up by a man called Paolo Soleri. And Paolo Soleri had this vision for an, a new way of, of building our cities, in America at least, to build them on marginal land, to build them where no cars were needed because everything would be in walking distance. And the optimum size of the city would be 5,000 people. Take care of the problems in our cities, he said, and the environment will take care of itself. 
and I was rather inspired by his books and, and his ideas. So I visited Arcasanti, and it's kind of a cross between a, a 1960s college campus and a set from Logan's Run. And I think when it was when they began to build it in the, in the early 60s, concrete was fi quite fashionable, but uh, nowadays it, it does feel, feel very dated. These are the uh, one-person apartments that, uh, that people live in there. And I also realized that the place had very little building work going on and very little being built in the last 20 years. Arcasanti is broke. And the reason for this, bafflingly, is that all of the money generated for this, uh, the building of this city comes from the sale of bronze bells which are designed exclusively by Paolo Soleri and sold in their gift shop. And I think what had happened was that he'd become uh, a bit of an overlord in, uh, in, in the city and, and created a stranglehold in Arcasanti, which was, which was a shame. But despite this, his ideas still resonated with me. He said, he said the city uh, designed for human intercourse and discourse is our appropriate habitat. And that struck a chord with me, that I really was a city boy at heart. After this, I headed out into America, and it was here, I think, in uh, Death Valley at the Devil's Golf Course that I really started to feel homesick, and I decided to pack my bags and come back to Brighton. Now, I returned home with Soleri's words ringing in my ears, the city designed for human intercourse and discourse is our appropriate habitat, and I didn't want to build a utopia out there. I realized that I wanted to make some changes here in Brighton, because I love Brighton, and I love where I live in Hanover. And the thing that had really been important to me was the connections I'd made with the people. And it was those inspiring conversations. It was those connections. It was the sharing that had resonated with me and hopefully taught me to be a little bit less self-centered. And it was also the hot tubs as well that uh, uh, were a real highlight for me too. And I realized that what makes us feel disconnected in our cities is a lot of the self-centered behavior that we indulge in. And this is Brighton after a typical weekend when people come down from London, empty their bins on our beaches, and then go home again. <laughs> and I realize that we feel disconnected in our cities. And we may be dealing with, with issues of the environment and pollution, but we've got a long way to go when it comes to loneliness and isolation. And so how ironic it was that I came back after my year's travel to find a poster for an event called a Zakala in my very neighborhood. And Zakala had been set up by a guy called David Burke. And the idea was simple. I think it's a genius idea. Through a poster campaign, he encouraged people to put a chair outside the house one afternoon in Hanover and to sit on it as a way of saying, I'm a friendly neighbor. I live here. Come and have a chat. And time was divided between sitting there and meeting and greeting and walking the streets and meeting other people in the neighborhood. It was a great success. It was free. It didn't require any council approval or health and safety approval. It was all done through the goodwill of the people in the neighborhood. He ran a second one. It was equally as successful. And then he left the area. He left Hanover. And then the Carlos were no more. And I'd come back after my year to discover this had gone on. And I'd missed both of the events. And so I had to think about what I could do to contribute something to my neighborhood. And Hecase's words came back to me. Hecase from Esalen, who had said, the gum wrapper theory, you see a gum wrapper on the floor, you pick it up, you become an example. And I thought, that's what I would do. So I tracked down David Burke. He'd moved to, to Lewis. And I said, I'd heard about the Zakala. I'd heard great things about it. People I spoke to in Hanover would love to see it return. Should we set it up again? He was delighted that people had remembered. And so this time, we started to use social networking. So we used uh, Facebook and Twitter. We found a local magazine that distributes to 3,000 houses, and they were happy to let us put a full-color poster in the magazine, so we got free posters to all of the houses in Hanover. And we, uh, we strapped a small boy to the roof of a car, <laughs> gave him a megaphone, and we, uh, we drove around, around Hanover, um, shouting at people, ordering them to come out of their houses, which they did. And uh, people even, this is probably illegal, but they, uh, they blocked off the street and, uh, and had a barbecue. Uh, one of our speakers later on, Sue Bradley, came with her partner Tim with their rabbits to show everybody in Hanover um, their pride and joy. And this is, this is my street, this is people from my street. And as a consequence of the food and drink that we brought out and the conversations we had, we now, it may sound small, but it's significant to us, we now have a cat sharing, uh, cat sitting scheme in our streets. So 
We now look after each of these cats. Um, we all have keys for each of these houses to do something as simple as that. We have a, a box outside uh, one of our neighbors, Simon's house, which collects organic waste. And so that's something that's all shared by the street. We have a little bit of grass in front of us uh, that we all go and have uh, barbecues and picnics on now and again. It's made a change in our street. And hopefully, it made a change for lots of other people living in the Hanover neighborhood. People came out and they played games. Some of them brought half the contents of their, uh, of their living rooms with them. Um, they set up barbecues. Uh, some brought uh, games to play. Someone brought uh, table football here for the neighbors to play with. Um, this lady didn't quite understand what Azakala was. She came dressed as the Duke of York cinema. <laughs> uh, and to me, this is where the progress towards utopia starts. And I'd like to plant a seed here for more Zakalas. I'll certainly be setting up, or we will certainly be setting up another Zakala in Hanover this September. And we hope that other neighborhoods in Brighton will follow suit. And we'd like to see maybe one day in the future when Brighton is the Zakala city, and it's a model city for the UK. And we maybe have a national holiday um, that is National Zakala Day. And then we're a model country for, for the West. And so the whole of the West follows suit. I don't think we need to set this up as an example for the rest of the world. The word Zakala is Mexican. It means open space. We'd be preaching uh, to the converted if we were to tell the Mexicans that they needed to, uh, to do something like this. But I think in the West, we need some incentives to come and leave our houses and connect more with, with our neighbors. And this, I think, is a perfect way of doing that. Thank you very much.